Good morning, I'm John Tucker. And I'm Karen Moscow. Here are the stories we're following today. In the markets, the S&P 500 beginning the day hovering at a record. The so-called Santa Claus rally has left the index just half a percent off its all-time high. Despite warnings about overbought levels, equities continue to power ahead on bets the Fed's going to cut rates as early as March. And Bloomberg's executive editor for markets, Paul Dobson, says there seems to be a lot of momentum in the markets. It may be an anticipation of big New Year flows into equity funds and people trying to get a little bit ahead of that as part of the, the explanation. I think, you know, we're getting very close to that record high in the S&P and the market loves the target to chase. Bloomberg's Paul Dobson says if the S&P 500 completes a ninth straight week of gains, it will be its longest winning streak since 2004. Well, in company news, John, Tesla could soon lose its title as the world's leader in electric vehicles. The Chinese automaker BYD's sales are forecast to overtake Tesla this quarter. Katrina Nicholas is global business editor for Bloomberg in Asia. BYD makes its own batteries and now it also makes its own chips. That has shielded the company from a lot of supply chain crunches over the years. Remember back in 2020 during COVID, we had a worldwide shortage of semiconductors and that snarled a lot of automakers. They couldn't get the chips that they needed to make their cars. And Bloomberg Global Business Editor Katrina Nicholas says BYD offers half a dozen higher volume models that cost much less than what Tesla charges for its cheapest Model 3 sedan in China. Uh, meanwhile, Tesla preparing to roll out a revamped version of its Model Y from its Shanghai plant. Bloomberg News has learned the electric car maker currently conducting preparation work in China and mass production may start as soon as mid-2024. Sources say the new Model Y will have much more obvious exterior and in interior changes than the most recent update in October, which added a new wheel design and ambient lighting. Well, John, another high-tech company in the spotlight this morning. Apple is appealing a U.S. sales ban of its smartwatches after the White House refused to overturn the measure. The company is trying to defend a business that generates roughly $17 billion a year. Mark Gurman covers Apple for Bloomberg in Los Angeles. Apple's belief is they have a software update up its sleeves that will bring the Apple Watch in compliance with the ITC. And so what Apple has done is they submitted details of this software upgrade to the U.S. Customs Agency. And on January 12th, the U.S. Customs Agency will make a decision whether or not to approve the refresh of the watch to make that fix. If they go ahead and approve that and the ITC and other entities in the U.S. agree, the Apple Watch can come back to market. And Bloomberg's Mark Gurman says the U.S. International Trade Commission determined in October that Apple violated two Massimo health technology patents with a blood oxygen sensor in its watches. And Karen, staying in the tech sector, a couple of heavyweights joining forces on artificial intelligence. Let's get details this morning from Bloomberg's Jeff Bellinger. Legendary designer Johnny Ive and open AI Sam Altman are enlisting a veteran to work on a new artificial intelligence hardware project. Sources say that as part of the effort, outgoing Apple executive Tang Tan will join Ive's design firm Love From, which will shape the look and capabilities of the new products. Altman, an executive who has become the face of modern AI, plans to provide the software underpinnings. The work marks one of the most ambitious efforts undertaken by Ive since he left Apple in 2019. The designer is famous for the products he helped devise under Apple co-founder Steve Jobs, including the iMac, iPhone, and the iPad. His hope is to turn the AI device work into a new company, but sources say development of the products remains at an early stage. Jeff Bellinger, Bloomberg Radio. All right, Jeff, thanks. Now we turn to the latest developments in the Middle East. U.S. strikes on targets in Iraq and fresh attacks by Houthi militants in the Red Sea, providing the latest warning signs that the war in Gaza risks expanding into a wider conflict destabilizing the region. Roz Matheson is news director for Europe, the Middle East and Africa for Bloomberg News. You've got all these groups operating in the region, supported by Iran, who are carrying out sort of unilateral attacks on targets throughout the region, including these shippers and, of course, Iran sort of warning increasingly that this does increase the risk that they get drawn in. It also increases the risk that the U.S. militarily gets drawn in because, of course, they're having to shoot down a bunch of this stuff as it's flying around the region targeting this shipping. And we're talking about a coalition of military ships in the region potentially to escort some of this commercial shipping through. And so all of that adds to environment of high tension. 
And Bloomberg's Roz Matheson says Benjamin Netanyahu says Israel will expand its Gaza ground offensive in the coming days, despite international efforts to halt the fighting. And back here at home, Karen, thousands of migrants and asylum seekers are moving north toward the American border as top U.S. officials prepare to meet with Mexico's president. That story this morning from Bloomberg's Ed Baxter. The caravan has reached Chiapas, Mexico, thousands carrying signs that say, Exodus from poverty. The caravan hopes to reach the border as Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Homeland Security Chief Alejandro Mayorkas meet with Mexican President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador. The State Department says item one is, quote, unprecedented irregular migration in the Western Hemisphere. Now, the U.S. says the parties need to address border security challenges and identify ways for Mexico to help in the fight. Some of the caravan have traveled from as far away as South America. Ed Baxter, Bloomberg Radio. All right, thanks, Karen. And that brings us to 507. Time now for a look at some of the other stories making news around the world. For that, we're joined by Bloomberg's Amy Morris. Amy, good morning. Good morning, John. Several pro-Palestinian protesters were arrested after swarming Rockefeller Center, Grand Central, and other areas over the long holiday weekend. Police arrested at least a half dozen people for disorderly conduct, menacing, and graffiti. Now in New York City, Mayor Eric Adams says there's always a serious concern about safety in Times Square on New Year's Eve. He says there's an added concern protesters will disrupt more celebrations after pro-Palestinian supporters tried to spoil the Rockefeller Center Christmas tree lighting over the this past year. The police department did an amazing job during the tree lighting to to uh, mitigate any form of major disruptions, and they're going to do it this year. Adam says NYPD will monitor online chatter. Top Biden administration officials are in Mexico today to discuss the influx of migrants. More on this from Bloomberg's Nancy Lyons. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Secretary of Homeland Security Alejandro Mayorkas will meet with Mexican President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador to address the ongoing border security challenges and what each country can do to alleviate the problem. Blinken's office notes the migrant across the southern border has been unprecedented. Blinken is expected to focus on creating legal pathways into the U.S., as well as additional enforcement. In Washington, Nancy Lyons, Bloomberg Radio. Now, one of Mayor Adams' main focuses next year will be trying to get the federal help on the migrant crisis. I have to keep hammering away at this issue, and I'm really pleased that we are now getting the chorus of other cities that are joining us. There are currently 68,000 asylum seekers in New York City's care right now. And a new program would allow New York City to direct money to new construction after a tax incentive favorable to developers lapsed last year. The New York Times reports the plan would direct public money toward mixed income housing projects in wealthier neighborhoods. The hope is that developers will produce more affordable units using the income Income from those high rent market rate apartments. Global News 24 hours a day and whenever you want it with Bloomberg News Now. I'm Amy Morris and this is Bloomberg, John. All right, thanks, Amy. And that brings us to 510 on Wall Street. Time down for the Bloomberg Sports Update. And for that, here's Dan Schwartzman. Good morning, John. Week 17 of the NFL season kicks off tomorrow in Cleveland as the Browns are hosting the Jets. Cleveland is 10-5. and five. Jets come in at 6-9. and nine. Jets head coach Robert Sala talking about how the Jets can take some inspiration from Cleveland's season. They're doing a really nice job defensively. They're playing at, uh, at an elite level, very very similar. Uh, special teams are doing very well. and um, But for sure, we'll, we'll definitely look at some things and areas where we can be uh, better. So if in the event if this happens again, we can... Uh, 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 keep the boat above water and, and kind of replicate what they're doing. That's courtesy of Jets.com. Trevor Simeon starting at quarterback for the Jets, Joe Flacco for the Browns. In the NBA, the Detroit Pistons setting a record for most consecutive losses in a single season in league history as they dropped their 27th in a row, losing to the Brooklyn Nets 118-112. Cameron Johnson leading the Nets with 24 points. Elsewhere in the league, futility in Washington as the Wizards are 5-24, losing to the Magic 127-119, while the Spurs are only 4-25 after a 131-18 home loss to the 
the Jazz. The Nets at it again tonight as they're home for the Milwaukee Bucks, while the Knicks are on the road facing the Thunder in Oklahoma City. The three-day NHL Christmas holiday is over. Most of the league in action tonight, the Rangers home for the Washington Capitals. Devils welcoming in the Columbus Blue Jackets. It's the Boston Bruins on the road at the Buffalo Sabres, while the Islanders are home for the Pittsburgh Penguins. That's your Bloomberg Sports Update. I'm Dan Schwartzman. From coast to coast, from New York to San Francisco, Boston to Washington, D.C., nationwide on Sirius XM, the Bloomberg Business App, and Bloomberg.com. This is Bloomberg Daybreak. And good morning. I'm John Tucker. We are looking at the risk of a wider Mideast war this morning. Fresh attacks by Houthi rebels on shipping in the Red Sea provided the latest warning signs. Let's get the update this morning. And I'm happy to say we're joined by Bloomberg's Rod Matheson, the news director for Europe, the Middle East and Africa. Roz, nice to talk to you again. Uh, it's not anything new, attacks in this region. What is different this time? Well, that's right. The attacks in themselves are not that new. They have been a pattern for, for many years now um, in this sort of narrow area of water in, in the Red Sea. And of course, the Houthis, who are based in Yemen, but backed by Iran, sort of quite often targeting shipping in the area, but again, sort of harrying them more than sort of causing serious damage. But what we're seeing is an escalation in that pattern of attacks in the, in the backdrop of the war between Israel and Hamas in Gaza. Uh, and we're also seeing it come against the backdrop of those other attacks that are going on, strikes against US um, forces who are based in Iraq, retaliatory strikes against groups that are operating in Iraq, all of those groups in the end sort of seemingly linking back to Iran, which says it's not trying to disrupt commercial shipping in the area, uh, but neither is it seemingly reining in these groups that it supports. And so all of that comes at a moment of high tension in the region. You've got significant military forces operating. The US Navy is in the area. Other countries, you know, sending naval ships to try and support shipping that's passing through. And so the, the possibility of sort of a broader conflict does exist as a result, although so far we haven't seen that happen. And Iran has sort of urged some restraint itself um, in a climate where you just have shipping in such close proximity. The possibility of a broader conflict cannot be ruled out. Is this going to draw in other actors at this point? Well, there are multiple actors um, on the sort of the Iran supported side already involved in different ways. Obviously, in the conflict itself with Israel, you've got Hezbollah still lobbying things from the across the Leban Lebanon border. You've got the Houthis um, operating out of Yemen. You've got groups operating out of Iraq. So you've got quite a few proxies at the moment for Iran operating in the region. On the other side, you've got the US Navy quite actively trying to support shipping, shooting down drones and, and other rockets as they're firing through the air from Yemen. You've got other countries sort of saying they want to send their ships to support. And this talk, this plan for sort of a naval uh, support uh, task force that's going to support shipping and, and deter further strikes in the region. You've got India talking about sending warships. So again, you've just got an awful lot of actors involved, none of whom who want really to end up in an outright conflict. But again, with so much um, shipping in close proximity, be it commercial shipping and naval shipping, the possibility of an accident even cannot be ruled out. Yeah. Is it likely that the U.S. would be forced to act even more assertively in this region? Well, they're very much not wanting to <laughs> unless they have to, particularly, again, when it comes to Yemen. The U.S. has been working hard in recent years to extricate itself from Yemen um, and, of course, urging the Saudi Arabians to also de-escalate there and not something that the U.S. President Joe Biden wants to get particularly directly involved in again um, and certainly doesn't want to get involved in a one-on-one -on -one conflict that involves Iran. Um, and so it does exist as a possibility. The U.S. very much doesn't want to end up with boots on the ground in another conflict. Um, they've become very risk averse about that. If you see prior history involving places like Afghanistan, for example, they don't want to do that. Um, but again, more and more, they are engaging directly um, in support of shipping in the region and shooting down stuff that might be even flying towards Israel from Yemen, for example. So at some point, it does become a bit moot. Are they sort of involved militarily? Yes. Are they directly military involved? They would say no, and they don't want to be. 
Um, whether or not this is your expertise, I don't know. But in terms of like the, the impact on commodities, especially oil, for instance, is it kind of surprising we haven't seen a bigger jump in commodity prices as a result of these attacks? Well, we are seeing oil at least being supported um, as a result of this. You've got Brent near $81 a barrel. It's about the highest level in almost a month. You're also seeing gas prices rise. And in a way, the, 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 the commodity that may react more to this is, is gas because of concerns around restrictions on supply in the region um, if Iran really got involved in, in a conflict. And so the immediate concern may be less about oil and how much needs to be shipped through that region or how much oil can come from Iran. But really, the concern is about a possible impact on gas. We saw some gas fields, in fact, out of operation in the early days of this conflict between Israel and Hamas that was out of an abundance of caution, um, and they've now resumed operation. But really, the, the, the commodity that may react the most to this is, is gas, and that's one that we're watching closely today. You're listening to Bloomberg Daybreak Today, your morning brief on the stories making news from Wall Street to Washington and beyond. Look for us on your podcast feed at 6 a.m. Eastern each morning on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. You can also listen live each morning starting at 5 a.m. Wall Street time on Bloomberg 1130 in New York, Bloomberg 991 in Washington, Bloomberg 1061 in Boston, and Bloomberg 960 in San Francisco. Our flagship New York station is also available on your Amazon Alexa devices. Just say Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Plus, listen coast to coast on the Bloomberg Business app, Sirius XM, the iHeartRadio app, and on Bloomberg.com. I'm John Tucker. And I'm Karen Moscow. Join us again tomorrow morning for all the news you need to start your day right here on Bloomberg Daybreak.